Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream, another episode for curious minds, because this episode is about extraterrestrial intelligence and the UFO phenomenon that is going on. My guest is attorney Daniel Sheehan, and I'll introduce him in a minute. Very excited to have him here. First, I want to say thank you to our sponsors, Dr. Dean here and Access Consciousness. If you're enjoying or interested in energy work, how to facilitate or attend the workshops, go to Dr. Dean here, H E E R.com or accessconsciousness.com. Check them out. And this podcast has been around for 14 years. We started on radio. It's been nominated for Two People's Choi Podcast Choice Awards for a Webby Award and was just listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 podcasts to listen to this year. Thank you, Welp Magazine. I teach business owners. I teach coaches, speakers, and entrepreneurs the time-effective steps to write a highly engaging book I also have a company that turns each author's book into a guaranteed, fully done for you, international bestseller. And I also show you how to book podcast guest spots and turn that around so you get massive results. I've got a free gift for you, tips on how to write and also how to be booked on podcasts. Check it out, my gift to you. It's debbie-inger.com slash gift, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift gift. So ETs, that is the conversation today. Again, my guest is attorney Danny Sheehan. He's the legal representative in the fight with the Pentagon to quicken UFO disclosure and ET contact. Daniel P. Sheehan is a 1967 Harvard College trained American government and American foreign policy scholar, a 1970 Harvard Law School trained constitutional trial and appellate attorney, and an expert in the field of comparative social ethics and alternative human worldviews. Over the past 50 years, as a trial attorney, public speaker, and university educator, Daniel has helped to expose injustice, protect fundamental human rights, and elucidate a compelling vision for the future for our human family. You can learn more about him at danielpsheehan.com. And with that, I welcome Daniel to the Dare to Dream show. It is so great to have you here. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you, Debbie. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. You are clearly an underachiever. So <laughs> I, uh, I have to say that when I was doing my research on you, I was blown away by what you as one human have taken on and created in your lifetime. So I wanna start there and just say, what has compelled you to make this your mission and to so fearlessly stick with it? Well, the, the mission is uh, sort of complex, <laughs> actually, that I had uh, at originally planned to be an astronaut. Uh, I. Uh, I was the number one nominee for the United States Air Force Academy uh, for New York State back in 1963 when I graduated from high school. I went to meet with uh, Senator Jacob Javits, mm -hmm. uh, who was one of the two Republican senators for the state of New York at the time, uh, explained to him why I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy to become an astronaut, to get to go out into outer space and get to meet the other members of the civilization that surrounded us. And he was sort of flabbergasted mm -hmm. as, the, as the United States Senator. And he actually said to me, you actually believe that there's other beings you know, here in our galaxy? And I said, well, sure, you do, you do too. You must, you're a United States Senator. You know, you're not stupid. You know, you know that they're there. He was so taken aback by it that he actually uh, confessed to me that he'd already uh, given his nomination uh, to one of his uh, major contributors, sons, uh, and that he apologized and offered me the appointment to the Naval Academy. And I pointed out that I wasn't into ships and boats. I was into airplanes and, uh, and flying into space. And he said, no, no, you can go there from the Naval Academy. But uh, he said, you can get the congressional appointment from your local congressman if you want to go to the Air Force Academy. So I said, good, I'll take that instead. 
uh, and it turns out the local uh, the, the local congressperson gave the appointment to the son of the mayor of Glens Falls, who was number seven, just in our congressional district competition. So I was uh, kind of flabbergasted by this whole process. I'd spent a lot of time planning to go to the Air Force Academy. I hadn't applied to any other schools. Uh, I was just sure I was going to be able to become an astronaut. But I realized that I was uh, going to have to become a lawyer uh, first. Uh, because the, the system didn't seem to be quite, uh, mm. wasn't in tune. It was off. There were these kind of straight up political corruption uh, dynamics going on. So I decided I would become a lawyer. Uh, so I ended up uh, going to Harvard College and uh, majoring in American foreign policy and uh, in government studies. And then got a, I was the Rose Scholar nominee from Harvard College uh, and then was uh, drafted by my draft board and wouldn't allow me to uh, leave the country uh, to go get the Rose Scholarship at mm -hmm. Oxford. So uh, I refused to go uh, and uh, went on to Harvard Law School and uh, became the co-founder uh, of the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review uh, and began a career as a, a, a civil rights attorney. Uh, and we initiated the case from the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review that ended up going directly to the United States Supreme Court in establishing the right of journalists to protect their confidential news sources. So that put me in very close with a lot of the major journalists and investigative reporters in the country. Uh, and uh, I got recruited by the, the number one corporate law firm in the country uh, who represented NBC, who was the client uh, for, the, for the case. So I went there and uh, in the context of doing the briefs in the United States Supreme Court on the case to establish the right of journalists to protect their confidential news sources, I ended up writing the uh, friend of the court briefs for the New York Times as well, uh, and for CBS and ABC and the Washington Post. So I got to meet even more journalists. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so when the New York Times got the Pentagon Papers case, uh, the Pentagon Papers, uh, uh, Jim Goodell, the general counsel of the New York Times, called me to uh, have us represent the New York Times uh, in the major Pentagon Papers case. So I got to meet even a lot more journalists. <laughs> uh, and so that uh, I was then I was then recruited to, to go to the number one criminal defense uh, firm in the country, attorney F. Lee Bailey in wow. Boston. Uh, he brought me in because uh, he had been retained by James McCord, uh, the Watergate burglar, uh, who was a former CIA wiretapping specialist who'd been arrested in the Watergate Hotel, uh, along with the Cuban Americans that were in the hotel. Uh, and so I went to Lee Bailey's office and uh, we were the firm that represented James McCord who blew the whistle on Richard Nixon uh, and the plumbers unit. Uh, and so I began to get a lot of information uh, about the covert operations, the criminal covert operations. Why, why were those people in the Watergate Hotel? Uh, what were they doing? Why were they wiretapping the telephones of Larry O'Brien, who was the newly appointed head of the DNC, the Democratic National Committee? Uh, why were they Cubans in the in the hotel? You know, uh, why were they gunmen for the Traficanti Mafia uh, in the hotel? Uh, and as I began to explore all of this information, I began to realize that our United States government wasn't just out of tune. Uh, it was playing an entirely different song uh, than we had been taught uh, in high school and in college and even in law school. Uh, and so uh, I ended up going back to Harvard uh, to do my master's work and PhD work in comparative social ethics, uh, attempting to understand how it is that our country that was founded on such uh, ideal principles uh, could have uh, strayed, uh, strayed so far. Uh, and I came to discover that uh, the, a lot of the, uh, the ethos that we profess publicly to adhere to, we have never adhered to. Uh, you know, that it wasn't that I didn't know that we had uh, massacred tens of thousands of American uh, Native Americans uh, to take their land and resources away. It wasn't that I didn't know that we were built on slavery, human slavery. Uh, it wasn't that I didn't know those things. It's just that they hadn't quite registered because I was part of a privileged white male uh, ruling class uh, now with degrees from Harvard and Harvard Law School. And, uh, and I had just come to discover that, that, uh, that this, this, uh, there's an old Irish aphorism 
the Irish refer to uh, Ireland as the old sod. That's how they refer to it. And there's an old Irish aphorism that says, ah, well, the old sod isn't what it used to be, but then it never was. Uh, and so I, I came to realize that I needed to do some deeper studying about our history, uh, the moral ethics of our country, what natural law was all about. And so I went back and was doing my, uh, my master's work and it just rolled over into the PhD program when I got recruited by the United States Jesuit order. Uh, the United States Jesuit order headquarters in Washington, DC uh, was looking for a general counsel. Uh, and since I already had my law degree and I was writing papers at Harvard Divinity School, one of the professors at Harvard Divinity School, uh, Father Roger Couture, who teaches the course on the theological underpinnings of human rights, uh, recognized me uh, in what I was doing and writing. And he contacted the Jesuit headquarters and recommended me to be their new legal counsel for the brand new Jesuit headquarters in the United States. So I got recruited to go to the Jesuit headquarters. And there I was uh, suddenly with the largest single uh, order in the Catholic church, which is the largest single uh, religious denomination in all of Western civilization, uh, going back and forth to Rome uh, and getting to meet there with the, the, uh, the Vatican staff people and, and, and developing a planetary perspective rather than just the just the uh, the United States and and uh, and I was there when I was contacted when uh, President uh, Jimmy Carter was elected uh, in uh, in 1976 turns out that he immediately uh, after being elected uh, on November 4th of 1976 before the 20th of November had contacted the director of the Central Intelligence Agency who at that time was George H.W. Bush uh, who had been uh, selected to head up the CIA by uh, President Ford, who had replaced Richard Nixon when he was impeached, uh, largely based on a lot of the information and evidence that evolved out of the Watergate break-in, <laughs> as you recall. So I was intimately involved in that, was actually approached by Chuck Morgan, who was the head of the Washington, D.C. National Office of the ACLU, to help draft the impeachment resolutions against Richard Nixon, uh, because I happened to have known what the facts were behind the Watergate break-in. Uh, and so that I ended up in Washington, D.C. at the Jesuit National Headquarters uh, when President Carter was elected because he unseated uh, then uh, uh, President Ford uh, and uh, he, when he contacted uh, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, the head of the CIA appointed by Ford, to demand, he demanded information about the UFOs uh, and about the possibility of there existing an extraterrestrial civilization, uh, because he had seen a UFO when he was governor of Georgia. Uh, and it wasn't just a light in the sky or something that would blink uh, weirdly or moved weirdly in the sky, he saw a full scale UFO. Uh, and so he knew that it was real. And so he wanted to find out about these. And, uh, and George Bush Sr. refused to give him the information, uh, stating that as president of the United States, he wasn't in a position to need to know uh, that information, that this was a, a deep secret of the national security state, uh, and that, uh, you know, he was only going to be here for four years at the most eight and was going to move on, whereas the, the national security state infrastructure uh, had reason to know about this, but he wasn't going to tell the president. So President Carter contacted the uh, House of Representatives uh, Science and Technology Committee and had them contact the Congressional Research Service uh, and demanded to have the Congressional Research Service conduct a uh, a, a secret investigation uh, of all the information that existed inside the United States government about UFOs and the possibility that they were actually vehicles from an extraterrestrial civilization. So I was contacted uh, by Marcia Smith, who was the head of the Science and Technology Division uh, of the Congressional Research Service. And she asked me if I would be able to contact the Vatican to see if we could get the information from the Vatican out at the Jesuit headquarters about UFOs and potential extraterrestrial civilization. So uh, I cleared that through my superiors at the Jesuit order. Uh, and very importantly, they agreed uh, to have me do this. 
Uh, and so I reached out to the Vatican uh, and they said, no, <laughs> they, they weren't going to give even the Jesuit headquarters in the United States this information. Uh, and so uh, I told Marsha Smith that, you know, I apologize, but it wasn't, we, they weren't going to give it to us. Uh, and so she ended up asking me if I would go to the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory to the SETI program, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and deliver a uh, three-hour closed-door seminar to the top 50 scientists at SETI on the theological implications of contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. Uh, and so uh, I did that. In the context of, of preparing for that, I uh, asked the, uh, the Congressional Research Service to reach out and attempt to get access for me to the classified portions of the Project Blue Book. Uh, and uh, much to her surprise uh, and to my pleasure, uh, I was granted that access. Uh, and so I got to actually see uh, absolutely definite photos of UFOs, uh, actually a crashed UFO uh, with uh, US Air Force personnel all around it, taking photographs and, and camera film footage of it, et cetera. So I knew that this was, uh, this was uh, true. Uh, so I went back and reported it to the Jesuit headquarters and Father Bill Davis, who was my immediate superior, I was a candidate for the Jesuit priesthood by that time. Uh, and uh, uh, Father Bill Davis, when I reported this to him uh, and showed him uh, a, a, a yellow pad that I had copied symbols off this UFO onto this yellow pad that I had and, and gave it to him, he reached, he reached down and opened up his desk drawer and took out a manila envelope and open, had me open it up, and there was a eight and a half by 11 black and white glossy photograph of a UFO in his desk, the head of the Jesuit office. And so I said, where did you get this? And he said, uh, uh, my, my sister uh, gave it to me. Uh, and I said, uh, wait a second, uh, where, where did she get it? He said, her husband, Michael, gave it to her. He was the, uh, the chief uh, 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 at the Seattle Airport. He was a traffic controller at the Seattle Airport. And one of his best friends, who was a, a pilot, a commercial pilot, had taken this photograph uh, out of the window uh, of his airplane. Uh, and he was so frightened about turning it into anybody and letting them know that because he didn't want to lose his job, which we can talk about. Uh, but so he, he said, I'm going to bring it to my best friend, Mike, and give it to him, who's the, the uh, air traffic controller at the Seattle airport. So he gave it to Mike, and Mike was worried about losing his job if he reported it to anybody. And so he took it home, and, and, he, and he gave it to his, his wife, Dodie. And he said, here, Dodie, give this to your brother. He's a priest. <laughs> so you say to yourself, what does that mean? Well, what does all that mean? What it means is that the United States Defense Department and the Central Intelligence Agency, part of the national security state, the same people that were refusing to give the information to the president of the United States, uh, had undertaken a covert program of attempting to smear and destroy the, the reputations, the careers, the entire life of people in official positions who were attempting to push forward to find out what the information was about the UFOs. Uh, that the national security state had had obtained. Now, I began to look into this and investigate this. And I was in a position to have a lot of friends who were investigative reporters, as I've pointed out, uh, because of the work that I had done for them. And I had also Jesuit priests in 42 different countries uh, who, who, in fact, and there's uh, one were, of them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They're, they're going to say, don't talk about this. And they're, no, they're, they're the, but and anyway, so so the uh, so I had access to a lot of investigators, a lot of uh, a Jesuit uh, priests in different countries. I had access to actually to people in the Vatican, and I began a, a major investigation to find out what was really going on here. And I became absolutely convinced that there uh, a saucer, uh, an extraterrestrial vehicle, had crashed in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, in July of 1947, and that our United States military had recovered, uh, that they had recovered bodies of an extraterrestrial uh, species, that they knew about this and they were concealing it, uh, and that what had happened is President Truman uh, was uh, set up a secret committee 
uh, not, not within our government, not within the constitutional framework of our, our democratic government, but selected a hand selected a group of people uh, that entailed people from the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, but from private corporations, et cetera, and, uh, and assigned the task to this uh, private elite group to, uh, to figure out what to do about the UFO phenomenon. Uh, and so as, as I, I went to uh, the top uh, heads of the 54 major religious denominations in the United States, who have Washington DC headquarters and gathered them together and made a proposal to them to set up a special committee uh, representing all of the major religious denominations in the United States to, uh, to get out ahead of this issue, uh, not to be caught like the Catholic Church was with Galileo uh, and Copernicus, uh, who were so wedded to a worldview that was based on a proposition that the, our planet was located in the physical center of the universe, and that they built an entire uh, mythology around that particular postulate. Uh, and so that when anyone tried to challenge it, they basically arrested them uh, and put them in, under house arrest and actually burnt Giordano Bruno to the stake at a stake for trying to insist that the earth wasn't in the center of the universe. Uh, but once, once they lost that battle and had to acknowledge that science made it clear that our earth was not in the center of the physical universe. What they did is they immediately constructed another model of a pyramid with our human species being at the very apex of the pyramid uh, of all sentient life in the entire universe. And they spun out this myth that somehow the physical universe, the entire physical universe uh, was simply a stage on which for our single human species on this one planet, to play out its drama of evolving from, from a single celled, celled organism in the primordial slime of the planet uh, into a star-faring nation, and that we would go out into the universe and conquer the universe and spread our seed throughout the universe. Uh, and, and this was a new mythology that, that they were engaged in. Uh, what's happened, of course, is uh, in, in the course of all of that, of my uh, looking into this information with the particular resources that I had at my disposal, I ended up being contacted by Dr. John Mack uh, in 1994, uh, like 20, 20 years later, uh, to ask me to represent him because he had been, uh, he was the head of the Department of Clinical Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and he had had a number of these high ranking military officials who were attempting to insist upon uh, filing official uh, reports of UFOs. They thought this was a, a very serious uh, issue. Uh, they said, look, at these are flying around on our planet. We don't know uh, where they are, where they're from, but we believe that they're extraterrestrial uh, and that they're displaying a technology that is so vastly beyond anything that we have uh, that this can't be anything that's been made on this planet. You know, they were traveling at 43,000 miles an hour. Uh, inside our atmosphere, which would burn any other vehicle to a crisp. You know, we've all seen it with our with our moon landings and stuff coming back into Earth's atmosphere. They have to be extremely careful because their whole their whole craft could burn up on the friction of the the air in our atmosphere. And so that here were these vehicles flying at forty three thousand miles an hour inside our atmosphere, uh, and and plummeting from uh, from near space coming down to the surface of uh, our oceans in less than one second, coming to a complete abrupt stop, which would subject them to 600 Gs of, uh, of centripetal force, centrifugal force, and it would tear any assembly apart, except that it left them completely unharmed. And then they would go submerge beneath the ocean and travel at over 200 miles an hour under the water. Uh, and this technology was being observed by the United States, by our military, by our radar, and they were keeping it secret. Uh, and it was all being passed up the line to this secret group that was somehow in charge of uh, figuring out what to do about this. But it was not subject to any congressional review. It wasn't subject to any kind of democratic oversight. Uh, it wasn't even known about by some of the highest levels of our military. And so when any given major officer tried to report it and get it, get it investigated, he was immediately ordered to go get a psychiatric examination and part of the effort to deter them from doing this. And so some of these people had been sent to Harvard Medical School to get this type of an examination. 
And Dr. John Mack, who was the head of the Department of Clinical Psychiatry, was the one who administered these psychological tests. And he, after doing several of these, he was astonished because he said, look, this certainly is no career builder for these people to be making this up. Uh, and they're all talking about virtually the same thing. They're describing the same technologies. Uh, and because of that, uh, he ended up having other people sent to him, people who had not only seen these vehicles, but who reported in a very sincere, incredible manner that they'd actually had direct contact, physical contact with some of the occupants of these particular vehicles. And so John Mack was, was thunderstruck by this and, and began this investigation of his own. That he, he would not hypnotize people. What he did instead was this thing called holotropic breathing. It was a deep breathing exercise, sort of a Zen uh, or Hindu kind of a practice where they would get completely centered and relaxed and they could remember things in great detail without being hypnotized. And what he began to do is ask them questions. Uh, about what it is they saw, what did the beings look like, what did it look like inside their craft, and he began to realize that they were all talking about virtually identical events that were happening to them, uh, and that they had never talked to each other, they, they hadn't been in any way interested, most of these people in UFOs or extraterrestrial life before that experience, uh, and so he wrote an article for the New England Journal of Medicine, or the, the top peer-reviewed uh, uh, digest for the American medical uh, community. And he submitted the thing saying, this is an extra extraordinary event that's going on here. Here we have entirely credible, totally reliable professional people reporting this uh, and nobody's doing anything about it. Uh, they're trying to pretend that they're crazy. Uh, and so he, he sent it in the New England Journal of Medicine refused to publish it. And now, now, Dr. John Mack was a Pulitzer Prize winning author. He had written the definitive psychobiography of T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, was a Pulitzer Prize winner, the head of the uh, Harvard Department of Clinical Psychiatry, uh, who had written dozens and dozens of professional articles uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, not only refused to publish it, but they sent the, the application back unopened, refused to open it. Uh, and, and, and reported it to him that they weren't going to open it and they weren't going to read it and they weren't going to report on it. And so, so, so John Mack then contacted a publisher and had it published as a book. Uh, and as soon as the book was published, the dean of the medical school came to see him and actually uh, had him have to report to his tribunal of a, of a Harvard faculty committee. Uh, in the, the, the legal counsel for Harvard was on the faculty committee, the dean of the medical school, and chairing the whole committee was Dr. Arnold Relman, who was the editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, who had refused to publish the, the article to begin with. And they began to excoriate him. Uh, and so uh, Dr. Mack reached out to me as by that time a comparatively well-known national lawyer uh, and uh, asked me to represent him. And so I did. Uh, and in that context, we met with uh, Lawrence Rockefeller uh, and Lawrence Rockefeller agreed to fund an entire grand rounds uh, to the Harvard faculty on the issue of extraterrestrial life uh, and the reality of extraterrestrial uh, uh, life and the UFO phenomenon. Uh, and when we confronted them with that, they freaked out <laughs> and dropped all the charges against Can I ask you a question about that? Because um, I just had Stephen Bassett, Steve Bassett on the show. Yes. I know a little bit, you know, what he shares as well, he brings up the Rockefellers. Did they yeah. have a personal, anyone in the family have a personal extraterrestrial experience that they no. were so willing to fund and support the disclosure of all of this information? Yeah. There, there, there was no they, uh, it was just Lawrence. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I talked to Lawrence Rockefeller directly about that. And it turns out that he had never had any direct experience either or anybody in their family, mm -hmm. but his best friend uh, in school, had a direct experience. Uh, it was the Prince of Liechtenstein, who actually was on a, was hiking in the mountains, in, I think the Alps or somewhere in Europe uh, for a summer vacation and walked right up onto one of the UFOs that was sitting in a meadow. 
uh, and he walked over to it and put his hand on it physically. So he knew that it was an absolutely real thing. And he told Lawrence Rockefeller about this as his best friend. So Lawrence had, knew that there wasn't absolutely any reason at all for the, his best friend to make this up to tell him. And so he developed a personal interest in that. So it was just it was just Lawrence Rockefeller himself personally that had this intense interest about this. And so he agreed to fund a grand rounds at Harvard. Uh, and so I was preparing to do that. And John Mack introduced me, of course, to virtually everybody in the UFO field. You know, Stanton Friedman, Bud Hopkins, you know, everybody. Uh, and so I got to, as, as John Mack's uh, personal attorney, I got to be personally introduced to all of these people. <laughs> and so I got to meet all of them to bolster the previous investigations that I was engaged in. Mm -hmm. So I got this unique access to all of these different people. Uh, and when they dropped the charges against John, when we threatened, offered, uh, wished that we could make this grand rounds presentation to them, when they dropped all the charges, John created this group called the Project for Extraordinary Experience Research. Uh, at Harvard, uh, the peer group, uh, and they had experiencers come in and, and have these groups where they sat and talked to each other. I was privileged to be able to sit in on a lot of these conferences and, and discussions among these people. So I knew a lot of these people that had had this direct experience. I got to vet these people so that John would make sure that these were people that were honest and sincere and cre incredible people. And because of that, in 2001, I was contacted by Dr. Stephen Greer, uh, who was putting together the Disclosure Project uh, to present at least two dozen uh, government witnesses to the at the National Press Club in Washington D.C. in May of 2001, uh, and uh, and to to brief the staffs of the House of Representatives and the United States Senators uh, on this. And so I was asked by Stephen to be General Counsel. Uh, for the disclosure project. And I was the one that undertook the vetting of who the 24 people were that were going to be presented as witnesses. And so I got to meet all of those people as well, as well as all of the other people, uh, a lot of the other people that, that Stephen Greer had interviewed uh, and had you know a video footage of lengthy interviews with all of them. And I got to review these and determine who I thought the most credible witnesses were going to be. Uh, and so I, I did that, and I also was later uh, with Steve Bassett. Uh, I was brought on as general counsel to the citizens' hearings on disclosure that Stephen and the other folks uh, put together in 2013. So I got to meet all of those witnesses. Uh, and so now, most recently, I've been retained by Louis Elizondo. I want to uh, get to who, there. I want, yes. May I just go back for a minute? Because how I actually came to become aware of you, Daniel, is through Dr. Stephen Greer's documentaries, which you're prominently uh, featured in, and it was yeah. clear how knowledgeable and articulate you were. And so I became fascinated and here you are. I wanna know since you appeared in Greer's documentaries, which yeah. by the way, folks, you can get on, I think it's all on Netflix, very accessible, it's all free and highly recommended. How was the experience once his documentaries were released? Has the needle moved at all? Has anything beneficial become of it? Well, I think I think the uh, Debbie the, the actual event that has triggered this latest uh, I, I should call a surge of of interest and stuff about the UFO phenomenon was actually the resignation of Lou Elizondo. Uh, Lou Elizondo, back in 2008, uh, had been brought on uh, as the, uh, the chief of security for a new top secret uh, Defense Department study of the UFO phenomena uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, Senator Harry Reid, uh, the majority leader for the Democratic Party in the United States Senate, along with Ted Stevens from Alaska uh, and Dan Inouye from Hawaii, had pushed through a $22 million uh, uh, appropriation to set up a secret investigation inside the Defense Department. Uh, it was uh, under the auspices uh, also of the, uh, the Secretary of State, or excuse me, Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. Uh, and uh, Lou was brought on as the Chief of Security, as a specialist in security 
uh, over in, uh, intelligence information. And then he was made the head of it. He was made the executive director of the entire project. Uh, and Lou spent that entire time for uh, some eight years uh, as the director of the project after having been two years as the chief of security for the project. Uh, and he was becoming growingly frustrated because it was clear to him that there was a completely unconstitutional protocol mm -hmm. that was operating inside the Defense Department, blocking uh, not only the top level military officials that should know about this phenomenon, but blocking the United States Congress, blocking the President of the United States. And this is in blocking 2017. This, this, what this went all, it was a 10 year period from 2000, 20, 2007 all the way to 2017, he was there for 10 years, you know, and that he spent 10 years trying to get this information, trying to investigate it, find out what was going on. And what he was discovering is that instead of there being an honest uh, way of dealing with all this, that they were lying. There was a concentrated program of lying, dissembling, uh, lying to the American people, lying to the American Congress, uh, that uh, fabricating information, uh, destroying the lives of, uh, of, uh, of private American citizens, destroying the lives of political officials, destroying the lives of military officials who were trying to figure out what this phenomenon was. Uh, and so that he became growingly frustrated over this. Uh, he wrote a letter of complaint uh, to try to get to the Secretary of Defense, uh, General Mattis. Uh, he was blocked. Uh, the people in the Defense Department locked up his, his complaint and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't communicate it. And so he wrote a letter of resignation to, uh, to uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis and resigned, but not before he had secured the declassification of three uh, major F-18 Super Hornet uh, gun camera videos. Uh, of UFOs uh, that had been uh, uh, all around the USS Roosevelt and, and the USS Nimitz, uh, major uh, carrier groups. Uh, and the, the, they had uh, launched their, their planes to investigate these UFOs, had actually gotten video footage of them. Uh, Lou Elizondo uh, secured the declassification of these uh, and then resigned. Uh, and he and Christopher Mellon, who was the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence uh, under both President Bill Clinton uh, and under George W. Bush, uh, uh, who had retired, joined with him, and they brought these uh, videos to the New York Times. Uh, and my having been legal counsel for the Pentagon Papers uh, back in 1971, I was quite familiar with the seriousness uh, with which the New York Times takes uh, the potential release of any uh, previously classified information. So that that, that was a that the the major event that triggered this whole event was was Elizondo quitting. Uh, number two, his getting these videos and bringing them to the New York Times. Number three, the New York Times deciding to publish them. Uh, so that they, they uh, released them over their internet uh, website, the videos, and then on the 17th of December of 2017, uh, they published on the front page of the New York Times the fact that UFOs were real, that this is not swamp gas, this is not you know, misidentification of flocks of birds, uh, these are not weather balloons, uh, these are vehicles, these are, are real vehicles, a real phenomenon, uh, they're functioning in an intelligent manner. They're evading our radar. Uh, they're capable, and they started elucidating the criteria in the article that they're traveling at 43,000 miles an hour. You know that they're undergoing 60 Gs of uh, or 600 Gs of pressure. They can go 200 miles an hour under the oceans. Uh, they're being tracked by our nuclear submarines uh, through their sonar. They're being tracked by all of our uh, radar. Uh, and this is a, and this was an extraordinary event that took place. Uh, this publication by the New York Times of the reality of this, because so many people among the intelligentsia uh, in the United States look to the New York Times as sort of their their uh, metric of whether or not something is credible, whether or not this is real. And so the, it represents a step that has been taken by the intelligentsia in the United States uh, to demand the, uh, the public revelation of the reality of this phenomenon. And so this changes the whole 75-year 
history uh, of the UFO uh, phenomenon that began in earnest after the uh, Roswell event in July of 1947. So and may I ask seven, you, yes. so with this decades and decades that you've got of information that most eyes and ears have not seen or heard, and yes. the people that you've gotten to interact with, what is your contention about why they're here? Why are the celestial beings busy coming here? What is their interest, fascination, or mission? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a two-step process. The first, the first area of inquiry is, why is it that this is being concealed? Uh, wh why is it that the United States military command structure can't get access to this information? Why is it that the members of Congress can't get information about this? Why is it the presidents of the United States can't get information about this? What it is, is that there's very clearly this elite group. There's a, a, a super ultimately secret group that is garnering all of this information. Are and they, they DOD have to, related, Department of Defense? It, well, they, they, they obviously have reached into the DOD because they can task military uh, people to go to the sites of a crash and recover the crash and, and cordon off the entire area, declare martial law basically around the entire area, ban people from coming near it. And they bring the, the craft to Wright Field, now Wright Patterson Field in Ohio. They have control over Area 51, uh, S4 uh, in, in Nevada, where they bring these vehicles. They've been involved in attempting to back engineer the vehicles. Right, that was my uh, so, question. So is, right. this, they, they, is this ultimately about creating weapons or spacecraft to mimic all the technology that they're pulling apart and looking at from out, outer space? Well, it's, it's both, because, because they, they, view, they view the back engineering of this technology as a means of developing a weapon, uh, a, 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 uh, a fighter jet, a, a plane that can, can do these incredible things to uh, project US military power over the planet. Uh, there's, there's an old Sufi saying that when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are his pockets. Uh, and, uh, and so that when, when you have a, a national security state infrastructure that's been established here in the United States since December of 1947, with the passage of the National Security Act of 1947, they perceive everything that they can't dominate and control as a potential threat. Uh, of course, which includes the citizens of the United States. Mm -hmm. That's why they've been involved in, 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 a, in criminal projects like Operation Shamrock and COINTELPRO to try to surveil people in the United States to get, get us under their control. Uh, and that, so ever since the creation of this national security state here in our country in, in December of 1947, this elite has been viewing itself as being basically in charge. Uh, and that they view members of Congress to be just a bothersome event. They, they view presidents of the United States to be a bothersome event. They view even the high ranking military officials uh, to be a, a bothersome uh, event. Uh, and so the, 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 my opinion has come to be that this elite is trying to in fact monopolize the technology. Uh, and they not only wanna monopolize the technology to be able to make billions and billions of dollars in profit, by manufacturing uh, military aircraft that, uh, that integrate this particular technology to make as much money as they possibly can uh, for their shareholders. Uh, but they also are interlinked with the shareholders who own the major petroleum companies uh, and natural gas companies. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to withhold this technology from our human family so that they that their shareholders and their oil corporations can make as much money as possible, uh, as long as possible. And even though they're destroying the entire climactic system of our planet now uh, with global climate change, uh, they're still withholding the technology that could potentially provide an alternative source of electrical energy for our people and our planet because they are so greedy and so selfish uh, that this group has commandeered unto itself these, these particular technologies. Now, it leads to the second question that you ask, is that, well, why is it that the extraterrestrial species itself doesn't break through this and say, look at, uh, they've discovered that there's this nasty elite of one one hundred percent of one percent of our people that are greedy in, in keeping this technology for themselves to make profit for their shareholders and for themselves, why don't they intervene? Why don't they just come in and say, look, here's the technology you need. Uh, 
uh, in what, what there's there's two things that, in my opinion, based upon I don't know 45 years or so of of my working in this particular field. It is true. It isn't just the simple thing that like in Star Trek, oh, well, they've got this, uh, this uh, uh, prime directive that they can't interfere with any other civilization. So what, what, it, what it really is, is that they have a much more subtle mechanism by means of which they, they garner the trust of people on a planet such as ours. Uh, and that they, that they uh, our planet uh, is, it's not the only planet in our galaxy that gestates life, but it's one of the few. Uh, it's a comparatively rare event to have a planet that actually generates life up out of its, its chemical elements. The, 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 our planet generates, gestates life on our, uh, in, in our, in our uh, planet. And there are others in the, in the galaxy, but these are so rare uh, that, that the, the extraterrestrial civilization has what they view as a collective interest in protecting those planets because they're, they're actually harvesting DNA uh, uh, flora and fauna from our planet to help seed life elsewhere in the galaxy. And so the, what they do is they leave the planet unmolested, uninterfered with as much as it can. The problem is, is that if in fact a species arises on one of these planets where they start to threaten the actual viability of that planet as a source of gestating life, then they have to start making themselves better known. Uh, and that's why we began to see their appearances in dramatic form right after the detonation of the nuclear weapons uh, at the end of World War II. And, and the, that's why the first cra saucer that crashed in 1945 was less than 11 miles away from the Trinity site where we detonated the first nuclear bomb. That's why the Roswell crash that occurred in July of 1947 was at the 509th bombing group. It was the only, only air base in the entire, on the entire planet that had atomic weapons. Uh, and that this has been repeated over and over again, that they've flown over our Minuteman sites and turned off the missiles to show that they can do this. Uh, and very importantly, the, the contact, the direct personal contacts that have been experienced by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, a huge significant uh, plurality of the people report that in their face-to-face -face communications with the extraterrestrial beings, the extraterrestrial beings are trying to warn us they're trying to say, look at you have to stop burning these fossil fuels. You have to stop burning petroleum, coal, and gas. To, you're, you're going to destroy the climactic system of your whole planet. Uh, and, and you have to get rid of these nuclear missiles and nuclear weapons. You're going to totally, you can contaminate the entire planet for millions of years. You know, I mean, the, the half life of plutonium is 250,000 years, you know. And so they're, they're trying to communicate this, but they're trying to do it indirectly by not disrupting our, our society by saying, oh, look, we're only part of a huge galactic civilization. What they're trying to do is they're trying to communicate this information to our citizens. And our citizens, when we get this information and they try to tell anybody about it, they're being targeted by this CIA in, in secret defense department program mm -hmm. of, of crushing them of destroying their reputation, destroying their family life, you know, poisoning, the, making, making people's families think that they're insane, you know, constantly intentionally choreographing that narrative to get these people to stop doing this. So, so that what, what we see happening here is that, that we are on in, in the very brink of being victimized by this extraordinarily narrow elite on our planet. And we have allowed ourselves to be dominated by that. And so that one of the tests of a civilization of whether or not we're worthy to become, you know, members of the galactic civilization is whether we can overcome this inclination on the part of a tiny elite to dominate and control for their own personal self-interest because their consciousness is so low. Their consciousness is so low that they, they are terrified. When they stand out beneath the starry sky in the nighttime, rather than being awed by this fabulous wealth of, of life on other star systems all around us, they live in terror. 
they experience this terror of being completely alienated. Uh, they 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 look out into space and see nothing but rocks and in 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 cold death with no oxygen. And so what they do is they recoil into themselves and they contract uh, and they start to try to establish domination and control over everything around them. It's a, it's a very specific, it's, these people are rooted in their root chakra. They're, they're attached to their root chakra mm -hmm. and that chakra is dominating their entire consciousness. They, they are just desperate to survive in their own individual incarnated capacity. Uh, this has to do with consciousness. That's why the Conscious Life Expo is yeah. so important. That's, that's why all of these things to raise consciousness of people. The reason from the very beginning that I wanted to be an astronaut, when I first discovered what stars are, when I set out in my little grassy yard in Fort Ann in New York, a bird, New York State, I would look up and see this huge tapestry of stars. And, and I would see the stars pulse out and I said, oh, look at there's there's planets around those other stars. Isn't this fantastic? And, and it became so weird to me that we as a human species on our planet, in light of this dimension of reality, are doing the things to ourselves that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're 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 using our creativity to to dig into the earth and raise up the metals to make guns and bullets to shoot lead into hot hot lead into each other's bodies because we draw lines on the on the soil and say you can't come on my side of this this line, uh, you know. In the in the it, what it was is that these kinds of conduct on the part of our human family that are so contrary to the natural laws of our universe. Uh, is, is, is a reflection of our low consciousness. Mm -hmm. The higher your consciousness is, the more comprehensive your experiential uh, experience is of the, of the reality around you. Right, uh, so if certain, it sounds like if certain mega corporations would only step out of the way, these ET advanced technologies could actually benefit our entire humanity and planet. And if they would right. stop controlling, we could have a completely different outcome. So right. let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you think we're any closer to full UFO disclosure? Is there any hope? Well, I, I think it's it's I, I don't think that I don't think that we can rely upon, you know, conscious disclosure uh, by the national security state people uh, until you get rid of the national security state. <laughs> the, but by definition, the national security state exists rooted in this bizarre consciousness, you know, and they lie and they dissemble. Uh, you know, when I, I had Gov 182 at Harvard College under Henry Kissinger, right? And Henry Kissinger, in the very first day of the class, he would say, uh, well, gentlemen, he says, uh, this, I was the last all-male class at Harvard College, right? He says, well, gentlemen, he says, if there is any man here in this class who believes that our nation cannot lie and cheat and steal uh, and even kill uh, to pursue our own national interests, then you shouldn't be in this class. Right? That was what he said to us. You know, and I said, holy mackerel. I said, I'm staying in this class. I want to see what they're talking about, what they're planning, what they're doing. And that's why, that's why right from the very beginning, I had a different consciousness because of my sense of expanded consciousness of taking in as a reality, the existence of other star systems in our galaxy and other planets and other lives in, in our galaxy. It is seen that every, all these kind of actors, Henry Kissinger and other people were so narrow and so confined and so completely incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that I had to do something about this, mm -hmm. you know? And so what I've done is I've stayed open, even in the midst of my doing the other cases with, you know, the Watergate burglary and the Pentagon Papers and, you and know, the Vietnam War stuff and all that. I okay. always stayed, yeah, yeah, I stayed open. I always stayed open to this other issue. And so whenever the opportunity arose uh, to participate in this process of trying to not make the government necessarily the national security state expose what they aren't going to tell you, but to get rid of the national security state, to have a genuine functioning social democracy uh, in our country, and to share this information with other people around the world, how we can have an honest and open democratic self-governing process where we can share the resources of the planet 
We can share the expertise that people develop in different countries uh, and, and have a planetary culture. You know, this is the level of consciousness that actually qualifies us for citizenship in the, in the galactic civilization. Uh, but if we don't do that, if we allow ourselves to be dominated and controlled by like one one hundredth of one percent of the population of our planet, then in fact, we need to remember all species do not survive. Mm -hmm. All species do not survive. Mm -hmm. If you're not capable of uh, arising and adjusting yourself and your activities to the reality around you, you will become extinct. And that's what, that's what the threat is right now. We are facing a potential extinction event. Uh, with the, with the, uh, we, we see it right here as we gather here today. We see massive flooding, you know, uh, all through the, the Gulf Coast, you know, oh, massive yeah. flooding all the way to New York City and, and Philadelphia underwater. California, all of Northern California burning to the ground. Thousands of homes being burnt down, you know, uh, in, in these raging tornado fires drought drought uh, uh, encompassing parts of Africa uh, the Middle East we have uh, wars going on now over uh, we just withdrew from Afghanistan after 20 years why because our middle our national security state invaded the Middle Eastern oil fields to try to capture and maintain control over those oil fields at the end of world at the end of the Cold War to keep China from getting access to oil that was what really was going on. The entire thing was a complete set of lies, total fabrications on the part of the national security state. Oh, Saddam Hussein has nuclear weapons. He's going to blow us all up. Total lies. And the fact is we know they're lies. We now know that they're lies, uh, but they still stayed. They stayed for a decade after we knew that these were transparent lies that were being foisted upon us by the national security state. So we have to get busy. We have to not only in California, pass the California Green New Deal, uh, which our office is drafting, the Romero Institute is drafting a 350 page comprehensive Green New Deal for the state of California. Uh, the Democratic Party has a two thirds supermajority in both the state assembly and the state Senate. We have a, a Democratic governor in place who will sign the bill into law. We can demonstrate that we can get to zero carbon emissions how can 20, we support that, Daniel? What can we do well, to help support? What you, what you can do is you can contact the, the, the uh, Romero Institute. It's RomeroInstitute.org. Uh, and there's, there's Let's Green California dot com. Let's Green California dot com. Uh, and the Romero Institute. Dot org, And you can find all that there's an action center there so that people can contact uh, Governor Newsom demanding that he declare a state of climate emergency in the state of California. Uh, everybody can go out and vote. Everybody can go out and vote in this recall. This is preposterous, you know, that they've got 46 other candidates uh, that are in this recall thing. And unless Gavin Newsom gets 50% plus one vote, he, he's going to be removed. And the a person, uh, one of those 46 candidates who gets only like eight to 10% of the vote out of all the other votes could be governor. And there, there's these, the, like Larry Elder is one of, the, one of the candidates who's an absolute maniac. He's a, he's a right wing fundamentalist talk show host who's a total QAnon conspiracy theorist who wants to, doesn't even believe in global climate change. Uh, I mean, he's, he's a maniac. Uh, and the fact is that he's leading now in the polls because he's got this vir uh, virulent uh, following uh, that are organizing and getting all their people to vote. And most of the most of the liberals and progressives are going, oh, well, you know, Governor Newsom, you know, I'm not totally happy with him anyhow. Or, you know, oh, I heard that he he won't declare even a, a state of a climate emergency in the state of California. Why should I bother supporting him? You know, that's crazy talk. That's crazy talk. I mean, people have got to they get a call, get on the internet and go to RomeroInstitute.org, uh, LessGreenCalifornia.com, uh, and there's an action center. You can sign a letter going to, and, and we'll send it directly to the governor to demand that he declare a state of climate emergency in California. You can find out all about the Green New Deal bill. We've got a 50-page uh, outline of the bill. We're working with uh, with people in the Senate. We're working with people in the in the state assembly. 
we're doing all the knit and grit, you know, logistical work that needs to get done, but our people have to be, have to be mobilized. We have to come to grips with this. It's important to remember the intersection of this whole thing is this, is that with the rise of global climate change and the, the uh, elevating of the, na of the sea levels, that as you know, what's happening is people think that because of the melting of the ice packs on the North and South Pole, that the billions of tons going into the ocean every year is what's really causing the sea level rise. It's the heat. It's the increased heat of the planet. The mean global temperature is exciting the molecules of water and expanding the size of the oceans. And so the, the sea levels are rising. We've already seen Fukushima in Japan. What it causes is it increases the storm surges because the storms are getting more and more violent as we have seen. And the, the storm surge flooded the Fukushima, Fukushima uh, nuclear reactor. They're now pouring you know, thousands of gallons of water a totally radioactive water out of that facility into the Pacific Ocean every single day, every single day. And it turns out there's another 115 new power plants directly on the sea coast around our planet. So we can be looking at 115 Fukushimas, you know, exploding with a storm surge filling up their, their, uh, their uh, nuclear site and causing the explosion of those facilities poisoning our oceans. And with the flow of the thousands and tens of thousands of gallons of fresh water out of the melting ice caps on our planet, what it's doing is it's lowering the salination levels of the ocean and lowering the density of the water in the ocean, even though they're expanding in the underwater currents that flow from the equatorial regions of our planet, both up into the Northern hemisphere and Southern hemisphere that generate the, the temperate zones where 70% of all the food on the planet is grown uh, is, is in danger because as the, as the water, the density of the water decreases, the, the underwater currents will rise to the surface and dissipate. Uh, and and the, the equatorial regions of the planet by 2026, it, with the exact level of carbon emissions that are being emitted as you and I sit here right at this moment, into our planet's atmosphere. By 2026, if this continues, that the entire equatorial region of our planet is gonna go above three degrees centigrade increase uh, over the beginning of the industrial age. And what's gonna happen is gonna start killing the rainforests, killing, not, not just cutting them down and burning them uh, so that they can grow more cattle, so that they can have more meat for people to eat. But, but the fact is that they're going to start killing the rainforest. And the rainforests are the lungs of our planet. They're the ones pulling carbon down out of the atmosphere and transforming it into oxygen for our planet. But in, by 2026, if we don't get to net zero by 2026, then what's going to happen is those rainforests are going to be started to be killed by the temperatures of over 130, 140 degrees. And they're going to turn from carbon drawdowns into giving off more carbon because they're rotting and decaying and dying. Uh, and the oxygen is going to be depleted on our planet. We have to understand that we are in the eschaton. We are at that point now where the, the moral turpitude of this portion of the people, our human family, are killing our planet. And our people are shifting around one foot from another and pacing back and forth saying, woe is me, woe is me, isn't somebody going to do something? You know, we all have to do something. We all have to mobilize. We all have to go to the RomeroInstitute.org. We need to go to uh, uh, letsgreencalifornia.com. We've got to write letters to the governor. We've got to vote to stop the recall. There's got to be a governor in that office that's going to sign our bill when we get it passed. And you have to be ready to be mobilized. And we've got six major Senate districts out of the out of the 40 that we've targeted. We've got another uh, 15 different assembly districts that we've gotten targeted that are the swing votes on the key committees inside the Senate and the assembly who have to pass this bill out of those. We know what we need to do. Uh, you, you, you know, all you get people need to do is know where to come. Who is, is doing this work? We're doing this work, just like I've been doing for 50 years. And this is the intersection between the UFO phenomenon, the existence of extraterrestrial life, and the issue of global climate change, and also the issue of nuclear weapons, because the private nuclear power plants were all created simply as a ruse 
for continuing to, to build nuclear weapons, that they wanted to have those nuclear uh, power plants to rationalize the continued generation of plutonium. You know, we did the Karen Sogwood case out in Oklahoma, which was the nuclear reprocessing plant where they were going to try to reprocess the spent nuclear fuels from the 113 nuclear power plants in the United States. They were going to bring the spent, yeah, the bring, bring the spent fuel there. You know, there are two different cases. We also did Three Mile Island. <laughs> we did the Three Mile Island case to stop them from pumping the radioactive effluents from the core into the Susquehanna River. We did the Karen Silkwood case out in Oklahoma to stop the reprocessing plant where they were smuggling 98% pure bomb grade plutonium that had come from the waste materials from the nuclear power plants to deliver nuclear weapons to Israel and Iran, both Israel and Iran. They were delivering special nuclear materials and under the agreement that they shared them with who? South Africa, under the apartheid government of the Afrikaner government and, and Brazil, under the, the, uh, the days of blood and iron their fascist government that was in Brazil at the time. You know, this is the national security state. This is the, the sinful structure that has evolved on our planet. And we as a people have to rise up and do everything in our power to disempower this national security state, to disassemble the national security state, to get rid of the National Security Act of 1947. And we also have to get rid of these corporations. You know, this, this private shareholder, stockholder corporation didn't even exist until 1872. This whole device by means of which the owners of all the resources of the corporation are completely immunized against any personal liability for whatever the corporation does that they own the stock in. And the management are all completely personally immunized. The only thing that's liable is the corporation itself and its assets. And so it has no conscience whatsoever no conscience whatsoever. All it does is pursues the maximization of the short-term profits for their stockholders. It's like, a, it's like a, a, a beast out of control. And we have to get rid of that. That is a fundamentally sinful structure, the, the private shareholder corporation. We have to get rid of it. Uh, not just try to tame it, not just to try to rein it in like Frank, Franklin Roosevelt tried to do, you know, after the massive uh, depression of 1929, you know, we've got to get rid of them. If anybody wants to be an entrepreneur and gather together their friends and invest in making a product, fine, but you have to be held responsible for what your product does. And if your product hurts people or kills people, you have to be personally liable. Uh, that, that's perfectly sound and reasonable. That's, we've developed the entire Anglo-American common law to hold people responsible for what they do. The corporations have been designed to protect them and to let them get away with you know, pouring sludge into our atmosphere, pouring poisons into our waterways, you know, killing our, our planet uh, and getting away with it. These are sinful structures. Yeah. And we who have a higher level of consciousness need to move from a place of high consciousness, not to kill these people, not to, you know, not to have to you know, kill them and get rid of them. What we have to do is we have to take over the democratic structures of our own governments. And we have to spread the democratic concepts around the world in time to save our planet. Okay, so so that's that's what the message is. That's the issue of foes, issue of extraterrestrial the issue of nuclear weapons, the issue of global climate change. They're all part of the same thing that we have to deal right. with. That's why the Conscious Life Expo and yeah. other conscious conventions are extraordinarily important. Hundred percent. And I, I do want to make sure to tell folks who are listening to you and would like to go in person, the LA Conscious Life Expo, it's really worth it. And our guest here, Daniel Sheehan is going to be there. He's speaking on Saturday, September 18th, as well as Sunday, September 19th. Just so you know, you can go in person. That's what I would recommend. But if for whatever reason you cannot, you can also live stream the entire event. And uh, Daniel, this is Dare to Dream. So what do you next dare to dream? I, I dare to dream that our people will mobilize here in the state of California to pass the Green New Deal. I, I dream that we will then on a national level mobilize to pass a national Green New Deal. We will transform our culture from a, a supply side economic model 
of just uh, our whole culture does nothing more than what the corporations want to supply to us as products and into a demand driven uh, economic system that will respond to the demands, the needs of the people uh, in democracy will flourish. Uh, that's what that's what I dream. And I, I work at it. We've been trained, all of us, interestingly enough, have been trained to believe in that dream. What we have to do is wake up and dream the dream into life. You that's what implement. we have to do. Yeah. Yes, 100 percent. I love that dream. I love those websites. So, folks, I just urge you to get involved after what you heard, the RomeroInstitute.org and look for Let's Green California. So important. Daniel, I thank you so much for coming on the show today and for everything you shared with us. Terrific, Debbie. I appreciate it. It's a privilege. Mm. I end today's show with this quote from Metrodorus of Chios. It is unnatural in a large field to only have one shaft of wheat and in the infinite universe, only one living world to consider the earth as the only populated world in infinite space is as absurd as to assert that in an entire field sown with millet, only one grain will grow. Subscribe to the Dare to Dream show. I answer all the comments. Thank you for being on this journey with us. And you're gonna to wanna to hear next week's number one transformation conversation. My guest is going to be Dr. Connie Zwig, she is the author of three books on the shadow and the reinvention of age. She's going to be talking about the inner work of age, shifting from role to soul. And if you're listening to us on podcast and you'd like to see myself and my guest, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Thanks for joining us today and create that big celestial, universal, healthy planet and humanity dream that Daniel was talking about.